I don't know if you notice it, but uh, I haven't recorded a sermon for the last three Sundays. And maybe some of you believe that these weeks uh, refresh and re-energize me and even inspire me to write one amazing sermon for today. And if this is your expectation, you might be disappointed. Don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I work hard for, on this reflection. It's just that sometimes we tend to build huge expectation uh, for a specific event or day. And when the moment comes, it's rarely as good as we dream. Paris is not as beautiful as I've been told. Uh, your team does not go as far in the playoff as you expected. And if you're like me, you barely remember what happened on your wedding day. A perfect example of this could be the United Church uh, document called Song of Faith. Since the beginning of our denomination, there's an understanding that each generation would be invited to write a text that articulate their faith in their own context. In 1968, a new creed was issued by our denomination or church. So in the 1990s, people believe that time came for a new statement of faith. Committees were formed, consultations were made, and in 2003, the United Church released Song of Faith, whose first words are, God is holy mystery beyond complete knowledge above perfect description. And the response of many was, really? We wait 30 years for a text that cannot even give us a simple and clear definition for God? Yeah. Well, most of us have been raised in a church context that gives us definition and explanation for, for everything and, and in the form that resembles to a catechism. Who is God? Well, God is the personal the eternal personal spirit, creator and upholder of all things. What is the church? The church is the society of the redeemed and was brought into existence by God himself through the work and risen power of Christ. By the way, those answers come from the 1940 United Church Statement of Faith. But now it seems that God is some sort of big unknown entity, a holy mystery. And some today are still saying, what a disappointment, what a missed opportunity. And somehow all of this makes me think of today's text from the Acts of the Apostle. After a successful passage in the city of Beroea, where many came to believe in his message, Peter finally, eh, Peter, sorry, Paul, Paul finally arrives in the city of Athens, the center of the Greek culture in the ancient world. The Athenians were known for their interest in the divine and their openness to philosophies and religions. So as he did in previous cities, Paul goes to the synagogue and the marketplace and begin to preach to those who happen to be there. Some philosophers notice him, and even if they consider him somehow a babbler, they still invite Paul to address the Areopagus, which was a, a council made of philosophers and, and wise men. I know it's difficult to imagine a council made up of those people in, according to their standards, so let's try to use our imagination, okay? So, and this group, as Paul, 
May we know what is this new teaching is that you're presenting. It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Woo. Convincing a group of philosophers and individuals known for their wisdom, it's quite a big challenge. But if someone is up to this, can do this, well, Paul was the man. We can find many examples in our Bibles of his ability to adapt his message and behaviors to meet people where they are, where they were. As he stood in front of the Areopagus, Paul did not begin his address by belittling their, the Athenians uh, for their beliefs, condemning their uh, worship of idols, or threatening them with divine judgment, brimstones, and, and fire, eternal fire. No, no. Rather, he got them on their good side, good side by praising their deep religious convictions. You see, Athenians, like many Greeks, had temple and devotions for all sorts of gods who were overseeing different aspects of their lives. There was a god for, for commerce, for war, for wine, for harvest, for so on and on and on. So Paul says, for I went through the city and looked carefully at the object of your worship. I found among them an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. And Paul seized that opportunity to proclaim that this unknown God is in reality the Lord of heaven and earth, the God that he, Paul, is worshiping, a God who is the source of all life, not confined to a specific shrine made by human, made by human beings who depends on nothing and needs no sacrifice to show greatness. We have to admit, but Paul did that day is very clever. He used argument found in Jewish and great culture he quote material from an Athenian poet, and then he slip in the zinger. They are both offspring of the one and only God. And as we read this today, we, we can, can only say, well, that's brilliant. Nobody can resist to such a perfectly crafted argument. Paul must have won tons of converts on that day. And we go back to the text, and the text says, but some of them join him and become, became believers, including Dionysus, the Aeropagite, and the woman named Damaris, and others with them. Well, that's not necessarily impressive. We might be tempted to say, what a misopportunity. What a disappointment. Or maybe not. Maybe not. It depends on how we look at things. Paul's words at the Areopagus, like those coming from Song of Faith 2,000 years later, have a capacity to bring our faith and our spirituality somewhere else. These words, these reflections have the power to free our minds and our souls from a narrow understanding of God. They remind us that God cannot be limited to a temple or a beautiful sanctuary, restricted to specific function or specific powers and or even defined by one single species living on one planet in the universe. God is bigger, and God is greater than everything we could conceive with our human brains. Our God is indeed an unknown God beyond complete knowledge, above perfect 
description. And for us today, Paul's address to the, the Athenians is maybe not necessarily the perfect template to evangelize people, but more a solid basis on which we can initiate interfaith and interreligious dialogues. I don't think I have to explain to you how our society has changed during the last century. And cultural and religious diversity has become a challenge for many these days. In the interest of peace and harmony, some are trying to erase our difference. That's what they want by claiming that all religions and all gods are exactly the same. And they invite us to old end and to sing hymns that are generic and politically correct. However, another path is offered to us, a path that goes beyond platitudes and good feelings. We can build, like Paul, we can build relationships on the common ground, which is our quest for the divine in our lives, our search for a bigger reality than us, our desire to be touched by this light, our hope to find something that our words can only call God. We do not have to be exactly identical or to belong to the same group to recognize our similarities. We don't have to deny our beliefs and our values to acknowledge that we share a common journey. It, it's like an old Japanese proverb says, there's many paths leading to the top of a mountain. But from up there, all look at the same sky. So if we're ready to conceive that God is bigger than what we can imagine, we cannot expect to be always 100% right about everything. We have to be humble enough to accept that God is also speaking through a member of another church, another denomination, or even those who claim there's no such thing as a theistic God ruling over earth and heaven. We have, so for this reason, we have to create opportunities for real and faithful dialogue in order to learn from another. We have to imagine new ways to express our longing, our our unfulfilled needs. We have to develop hunger for different spirituality and transcendent experiences. We have to become searcher and seekers, unafraid to ask difficult questions that might not have clear and simple answer. We have to come together with all our human brothers and sisters and consider ourselves God's offspring. Yes, I guess expectation can be very tricky. And unfortunately, they often lead to disappointment. Well, maybe it depends on how we look at them and how we look at the world. Where some see a failure, others choose to see an opening. Paul's address to the Areopagus in Athens the United Church Song of Faith, or even this sermon can have a point in common. They are not necessarily as good as initially hoped, but they are still opportunities to wrestle with challenging questions, to open our minds to unexpected realities, and to engage honestly about our faith and our spiritualities. Maybe the bottom line is that no matter where we go or what we do, the opportunity is always ours to discover how the unknown God we worship is present and active in those we meet in their journeys. Amen.